if you're thinking about having more success or doing more, ask yourself, who am I spending most time with? Good evening and welcome to Entrepreneurship 101. We've got a great crowd out tonight and we have a fantastic speaker for you. Dan Martell is doing our first Lived It lecture of the year. Before I introduce Dan, I just have a couple housekeeping tips that I didn't do for those who attended last week. Um, you may have gotten a stamp card. Um, when you left, we will be giving out stamps for attendance about 15 minutes to about 6.15 and then we'll go away just because we've had, uh, we had people to come in like really late and we've decided that 6.15 is the cutoff. And I just wanted to give a shout out to our satellite groups watching at Innovation Factory in Hamilton and NORCAT in Sudbury. We're very happy to have them with us and we were excited that the program was mentioned in CBC Metro Morning in Sudbury, which was really cool. So with that, I would like to introduce Dan Martell. Um, I've actually asked Dan to speak about a year ago, and he was, oh, I'm having a new baby, you know, maybe next year. So we've been waiting a really long time for this. Uh, Dan is the founder and CEO of Clarity, a platform that gives entrepreneurs or helps entrepreneurs give and get relevant advice over the phone. He's a Canadian entrepreneur that lived in uh, San Francisco for about six years. He's been involved in the creation and sale of two other ventures, Flowtown and Spheric Technologies. So he's a serial entrepreneur, which is our favorite kind for the Lived It Lectures. He's also a mentor at 500 Startups, Grow Lab, and the C100, and is an angel investor in more than 15 other companies. I tried to get some, some real life stuff from Dan. It turns out he has a secret addiction to real housewives. Um, when we tried to find out which one was the best, it was a major toss up, but Atlanta won, followed by um, New Jersey in a close second. And he's a busy guy. He flew in from Moncton just to see us and the Jolt companies today. Um, and he has two uh, small children under the age of 13 months. So we're really glad that he could make it out to Toronto to talk to you tonight. And with, it's my pleasure to introduce Dan Martell. So quick show of hands. How many of you guys want more success in your lives? Hold them up high. How many of you want to learn how to do that tonight? Cool, unfortunately I can deliver on neither of those. But uh, if there's anything I know when you bring like-minded people like yourselves in the same room, great things can happen. Uh, before I get too, uh, into things, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. I know time is your most precious resource and I want to honor you guys and thank you for coming out. I also want to thank uh, Muriel and Carrie and the Mars for putting on this awesome event. Let's give them a big round of applause. So uh, if you have one of these, an iPhone, an Android device, a uh, Blackberry, sorry to hear, um, can you guys pull it out and hold it up high? Cool. One thing as Canadians, I'm going to ask you guys to do, if I say anything ridiculous, funny, something that's so stupid that makes no sense, please tweet it. Take pictures. What I want for the next 45 minutes is your divided attention. As Canadians, we need to do a better job telling stories, sharing what we learn with others, and I give you guys 100% permission to record, video, tweet, share, et cetera. Um, what I'm gonna do tonight is I'm gonna talk about essentially four stories that really changed my entrepreneurial beliefs and allowed me to have the success that I've had in my life, and then I'm gonna finish off with one of my favorite stories to tell about one of the best entrepreneurs I've ever had the privilege of working with. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I've been involved actually in five companies. Everybody talks about three because the first two were complete failures. I started a uh, site called Maritime Vacation when I was 18. Um, it was actually called maritimevacation.ca. Uh, so a big lesson I learned there was pick a bigger market than uh, Eastern Canada. Um, but that was a lot of fun. I, I actually built this site that allowed uh, cottage owners to list their sites online. I mean, when you look at things like VRBO and Airbnb, you think that that would have been a billion dollar idea. Um, but the biggest thing I learned from that experience was uh, if you can get anybody to your website that isn't your cousin, your best friend, or your uncle to actually give you a dollar, you've gone pro. Like, it is hard. Most people don't realize building a site that creates value that people are willing to pull out their credit card and give you money is really tough. I then went on, when I was 19, I started a hosting company because anybody that builds websites always thinks to themselves like, oh, people should be paying me for those monthly hosting costs, not GoDaddy. Um, 
That, complete, that company is a complete failure. I lost about 15 grand because I was trying to be legit. I bought all the software, the servers. Um, and then I realized if you want any life whatsoever, don't start a web hosting company. 24 hours support dealing with emails. Um, I actually was better than I thought in sales and ended up with a, a bank as a customer. That sucked. Um, and after about a year of struggling, um, we shut it down. But again, I learned a lot. I have no regrets in everything I've done. And it actually took me a couple of years to finally figure out what I wanted to do next. I eventually did a company called Spheric Technologies. That company grew. Uh, we got acquired in 2008. I then uh, semi-retired, essentially bought a house, a cottage, and a wakeboarding boat. Uh, I thought, what more could you need? After about three months doing that every day, all day, uh, I realized there's probably more to life than just laying in the sun, so I moved to San Francisco. I wanted to see, is this place what everybody says it is? Uh, so I packed up, I sold my house, packed up my suitcase and my mountain bike and ended up in San Francisco, and it turns out it actually is. It's a pretty magical, special place. Um, the, what I did for essentially a year is just learn marketing. As an entrepreneur, I thought, if you can learn how to get like, your marketing really well, you can get customers. I eventually started a company called Flowtown, Raise venture capital, that company grew to 50,000 small business customers. We got acquired in 2011. That was cool. Um, and then uh, a few months later, I started Clarity. And Clarity is a site that lets you find, schedule, and pay for expert, uh, expert advice to grow your business over the phone. I have this mission in life that I just felt that if there was a way that we could unlock all the advice and knowledge and expertise in people's brains and make it access accessible to people around the world and take away the location challenges and your social networks and just allow you to get access to that knowledge, that it could be a really interesting and important problem. So that's what Clarity is. First lesson or story I want to talk to you guys about, the belief that changed my life was don't listen to your parents. And the ones that are laughing know exactly what I'm saying. Here's why I say that. I love my dad, right? Cool dude, awesome. But my dad has no clue about internet businesses. And I would assume that unless your dad is Bill Gates, um, that if you're trying to start a company, their opinion and their ideas actually don't matter. And for many entrepreneurs, when you're starting off, you get frustrated like pissed off that you're, you know, like sometimes you'll go home, you'll tell your parents about your good idea, and they'll tell you the 101 reasons why it's not gonna work. And, the, and the, I think I'll probably do the same thing to my kids. It makes a lot of sense. If you think about it, when your parents are teaching you to ride a bike, they don't wanna see you fall down and hurt yourself. So they tell you kind of where to put your feet, they're sitting there running behind you, holding on to the seat, and only at the last minute do they ever let you go. That's very si similar to why your parents are reacting the way they are. So don't get pissed off. Understand what it is and try to find advice that's actually really relevant to your industry. For me, was the, the lesson that I learned this was uh, the one and only job I ever had. I, was a, I learned how to program and I got a job with one of the best tech companies in my city. And uh, it was kind of, oh, I'm not gonna swear. Um, <laughs> uh, it was, it was kind of interesting because uh, before I went to college, I did this like one year super expensive like tech thing. My dad's like, yeah, I've got some money saved up for your education. When you do good and graduate, I'll help you pay your loans off. I ended up getting a job making 60 grand a year and my dad's like, F that, you make enough money, like you pay for it. I was like, that's not the bet we had. So I ended up working at this company and uh, I spent probably eight months there, and it was kind of funny because like, my boss was in the States, and every day I would go into work, uh, and I got really creative about like, kind of what I worked on and kind of what I did on the side, and I even at one point convinced my boss that we needed interns, right? that the work was really tough and we needed to hire some interns. Uh, and he's like, okay, that sounds like a good idea. So I ended up getting two interns, <laughs> super fun. My rule to them was if we got all the work done before 11 in the morning, we could play Unreal Tournament all afternoon. <laughs> And I got really good at this, uh, this alt tab on Windows that essentially brought up like a screenshot of a Word document. So anytime somebody was walking behind us, you just saw all three of us go, Troop! and it would like change our screens, back at it, killing each other. Um, but you know, after eight months of doing this, it was fun, it was interesting, it, it made good money. I just felt like there was something else out there I wanted to go see. So 
Uh, I call my boss, his name's Russell, he's in the States, and oh yeah, this is on the internet, all right. Okay, uh, so <laughs> I should probably change the names of people. Um, so I call him up and I'm like, hey man, like I had this idea, I wanna move out west, you know, it's been really fun working here, but I, I gotta go see if there's more to, you know, I'm living in Moncton, New Brunswick. I was like, there's gotta be more out west, I gotta go see what it's all about. Uh, and this was uh, early 2001. And he's like, oh, geez, really? We're working on this big project. You're going to take off on us? And I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, we've got these interns. They're really good. Um, I've got to go work on this thing. Uh, so I'm giving you a month's notice. I wanted to be like, you know, super like, here's a month's notice. You have a month to find a replacement. So I go home that night. I tell my girlfriend at the time, come back to work the next day. HR calls me into the, their office. Dan, we're letting you go. I was like, why? They said, we just got a call and we heard that you're essentially going to be moving on and we figured since you're going to move on anyways, you might as well just do it now. And I was like, whoa, whoa, I was joking. I was kidding. I was just talking out loud. I should have thought through it more. And they were like, what? I'm like, who said that? Russell? That wasn't true. I, I, I'm not, I don't, why would he say that? We should talk to him. Call him right now. Because I was trying, I still had to pay off some student loans. I had a line of credit. Um, so it's funny, Russell's like, what? Okay. Uh, so I worked another two weeks and gave my notice. <laughs> but I remember the day that I quit, I called my dad up and I, I said, hey, dad, how's it going? Good. Uh, I got to tell you something. He's like, what's up? What's going on? I said, uh, I quit my job today and I'm moving out west. And the phone went silent. I was like, you still there? He goes, that is the worst decision you've ever made. <laughs> now, if anybody knows my story of how bad I was when I was a kid, I was thinking to myself, like, seriously? This is the worst thing I've ever done? Come on, Dad. Uh, he didn't think it was funny at all. Um, and I, I, I don't think there's ever a point where I ever felt like I disappointed my dad any more than that moment. I had the best job in the best city. He was proud of me. I was working for the best employer, and I just decided to get up and move out. Here's what happened. I left, so I, I went anyways. I said, I love you, Dad. I know that you do it out of, you know, you care about me, but I gotta go see what's going on. I leave Moncton, pack up, sold everything. I had a 1987 Volkswagen Jetta, two mountain bikes on the roof, and uh, drove out west September 9, 2001. As I'm driving across, I think I was in Winnipeg, 9-11 happened. Everything that I thought, every opportunity, every conversation I had built up to that point was gone. And here's the mistake I made. I paid off my student loans. I shut down my line of credits. I got rid of my credit card. I thought I was financially smart. Don't do that. Like, if you have a line of credit, pay it off and keep it open. Because if you don't have a job, you can't get one. So here I was, land in Calgary, every conversation I had, had prior to that went dry, and I don't even have money to get a hotel. And there was no way I was gonna turn around and go back home, or was I gonna call my dad and ask him for money. So I did what any resourceful person would do, I begged and borrowed all my friends to sleep on their couch. And I did that for three months. And for three months, I essentially, it was like round robin. I'd be like, hey man, I gotta stay there for two days? All right, show up three, four days later. All right, move somewhere else. And I hustled. Like I was so, like there was, there was so much in me that didn't wanna prove my dad right that I worked my ass off. I found a co-working space that let me work there for free. Every day I would make phone calls. And then one day out of the blue, this recruiter calls me and says, hey Dan, uh, we saw your resume online, and we have a client that'd be perfect for you. And I was like, really? Why? And they're like, turns out you learned this technology at that first company that you've ever worked in. You're the only, there's two people in all of Canada that have that certification. I was like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not cheap. <laughs> I had to go to the States to get that certification. It costs a lot of money. Um, and it was funny because here I am, I had no hope whatsoever, and this, this recruiter essentially had a customer up in Fort McMurray. If anybody's been to Fort McMurray, sorry to hear, it is, you know, somebody heard me tell this story and they're like, hey, would you, I have an opportunity to go there, would you go do it again? I was like, no. <laughs> Didn't know, had no other options, ended up going to Fort McMurray, 
Syncrude, this big oil company, they do like 200,000, probably three or 400,000 barrels of oil per day today, had bought this technology, had no architect to essentially work with the team and deploy it. So here I am at 21 years old, I get a call to go lead this team in Fort McMurray. Luckily the phone interview, uh, the interview was over the phone. So the manager, this guy named Darcy, he's awesome by the way, I don't mind giving him a shout out. Um, Darcy uh, says, hey man, sounds like you have the experience we need, why don't you start in two weeks? Pack up my 1987 Volkswagen Jetta, drive all the way to Fort McMurray, and I show up, they're doing an offsite where they've recruited the 35 people that are gonna work on this project and they're doing strategy meetings. They bought this portal technology, they're deploying it to all their employees, and here I am, the guy that's supposed to lead this team. 21 years old, knock on the door, Darcy here, he looks at me, you just see his face, holy shit. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I did my best, I was wearing like beige khakis, uh, red plaid shirt, I just shaved my head, don't ask. It was, whole, I, I mean, I couldn't have looked more immature. Uh, and he comes to the door and he, he pulls me aside and I could just tell something was off. And he goes, Dan, I should have asked how old you were. And clearly, you're a lot younger than I thought. You essentially will have people reporting to you that are 10 years older than you. And I know technically you know how to do this, but I'm not sure I can get their buy-in. So you've got two weeks to figure things out and show everybody that you can step up or, you know, thanks for coming out. And I was like, oh, crap. So I did what I think most people would have done in my situation. I went and I got a library card. You guys remember these places, libraries? Like physical, like, card. Um, and I started reading everything on project management. Uh, I learned things like Gantt charts. You shouldn't learn about Gantt charts. <laughs> How to create statements of work. Uh, I, I essentially had to learn in a two week period everything from budgeting, project management, software development, life cycle, quality assurance, because I couldn't come off at any point in whatsoever in the next two weeks in a meeting as in, like not knowing. And that contract ended up lasting two years. And for that time, I paid myself 40 grand a year. Everything was covered. I was making 150,000 a year. Uh, which is pretty cool at 21. Um, still drove the 1987 Jetta the whole two years. And that money that I saved up ended up being the seed capital that I used to start my company, Spheric Technologies. And after that company, this is funny, after that company got sold, I remember they, we got written up in the newspaper and my dad calls me up all proud. He's like, hey Dan, I always knew you had it in you, eh? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I'm pretty proud of you, and I'm like, thanks, Dad. Like, this is the guy that told me, don't go. And, you know, as much as I love my parents, I love my friends, you gotta understand, you gotta disconnect from people that haven't been there before giving you advice. And the way I look at it is I'm always appreciative. I love calling my dad. I love stopping by on Sunday afternoon, and he's like, hey, what's new with the business? And I tell him, and he, you know, when I was doing business, I did this, you know? Um, I love engaging him, but what I don't do is I don't actually take decisions on that. I don't internalize it. And that's what I would suggest to you guys. If you, if you ever feel like your parents aren't listening to you, don't get mad at them, accept it, understand it's normal, and then go find people that actually had the success and get advice from them. So that's the biggest belief that's probably changed my life the most. The second one is that I believe 100,000% that motivation trumps knowledge. So what I mean by that is it doesn't matter if you know how to do something, it matters more if you're motivated to learn. And I, I, I'm gonna pull out this pretty crazy example because I think it illustrates it quite well. Um, if you came to me and you're like, Dan, I have to, I, I gotta get $10,000 in sales in the next six weeks, I have no clue how to do that. You know, uh, it's my first startup, I'm, I feel like I'm gonna fail, what do I do? I say, cool, 10,000 in sales in six weeks. Yeah, awesome. Do you have a wife or girlfriend? Yes, if not, do you have a brother or sister? Cool. It's pretty crazy, but it works. Think about this. I say, if I put a gun to your sister's head and you knew damn well I was gonna pull that trigger in six weeks, if you didn't get that 10,000 in sales, right now, as you think about that, what's the probability you won't be able to do that? Zero. There's no doubt in that person's mind that they could pull it off. What changed? 
motivation. And I feel that for a lot of entrepreneurs, the only thing stopping them from being successful is not knowing how to do anything, is making sure that they actually burn the bridges, put their, their back against the wall, and fight because it, they need to make it happen, right? And that is the biggest thing that I've seen. When I started Spheric Technologies, I took all that money that I saved up doing, working at Syncrude and thought, oh, this is great. I'm starting a company. I was 24. I had, I think at that point, I'd saved like 100,000 in the bank. I hired three guys, two guys I knew. They were the two the interns that I ended up working with at the first company. <laughs> they're brilliant still to this day. And I think there's something about multitasking and all that stuff that good indication. Anyways, um, I called these guys up. I said, hey, I'm starting this new company. I want you guys to work for me. They're like, we're in. Cool. Then I asked this question, which I asked a lot of people. Who's the smartest person you know? Who's the smartest person you've ever met in this city? Andrew. Cool. Where's Andrew? I'll get you a meeting with Andrew. Done. I meet with Andrew. Andrew's like, he kind of looks like a rock star. You know, like, he's about yay tall, like cut jeans and like uh, chuck sneakers. And I'm like, hey, everybody says you're super smart. I'm starting this new company. I want to work with you. Right? I was like, I was 24. I figured everybody else, you know, 21, 22. Andrew's like, uh, you know, I, I'm working at this really great company. I said, yeah, I know. I used to work there. I said, but I'm going to build this really interesting thing, and I think you'd, you'd, you'd want to be part of it. I can pay you. It's like, cool. So he, he says, all right, I'm in. I was like, great. Two weeks later, I'm uh, driving to his house. I got to give him the paperwork, like the HR stuff. I was never good at paperwork. Anyways, I got to go get him to sign his contracts. I show up to his house. I knock on the door, and this two, three-year-old, blonde-headed girl opens the door. I was like, hey, is Andrew here? She turns around and she screams, Daddy. I was like, oh, shit. I didn't know he had any kids. Andrew runs up the stairs, opens the door a bit more, and he goes, hey, Dan, I want you to meet my wife, Jill. Points upstairs to the kitchen. Here's this beautiful blonde woman with a, like a bump. And I cannot tell you how much I was like thinking, holy shit, I, like, of course I want to be successful. Nobody wants to fail. But I did not want this guy that had a three-year-old and a wife that was pregnant to quit the best company to work for in my city to start working on a startup that at best may not fail in the next six months. So I didn't flinch as you shouldn't. As an entrepreneur, your job is to run into battle and make everybody feel secure that that's a good thing. So we signed the paperwork and I left. You know, and I felt good. We had contracts and customers. And three months into it, and I love my dad, and he used to say this word, cash flow, cash flow. And I'm like, cash nothing. You should see the money we're making. It's, everything's great. I didn't need to know about this thing called cash flow. My accountant calls me and says, Dan, you're not going to be able to make payroll. I'm like, how is that possible? I have customers. We've been doing work. We're getting paid. He goes, Dan, when you do the work, so we had customers like Procter & Gamble and Dole Foods and Johnson & Johnson. We essentially, I hired these guys. We went and worked with the companies. After 30 days, I would invoice. And their payment terms were net 60. Most of them paid net 90. And then here's the kicker. They would send a check in the mail that when my bank got it, froze it for 20 business days because I was a new business. And I was pissed. I had saved my money for years, started this company with cash in the bank, had customers lined up. And here I was learning a lesson that I could hear my dad screaming in my ear. And I was just, I was, I was like, could not believe it. But like I said earlier, I turned to people that I thought maybe had been in this position before. And they taught me about this thing called factoring. And it is a beautiful thing. It's actually an interesting business. Factoring allows you to sell your receivables, and they'll take, it's kind of like a payday loan for businesses. So if you've ever like, well, I'm sure nobody in this room has done it, but if you ever sold your paycheck before you actually cashed it, that's what factoring is. And I'll tell you, like, that saved my business. I ended up finding a company. I factored all my receivables. I got some cash. These guys never, ever knew until I started telling the story not too long ago. It's the first time that they ever, again, as the entrepreneur, the CEO, the founder, it's not your job to make them nervous. You're supposed to take the burden of it. 
But what I learned from that lesson is that if I didn't have Andrew to make, to be committed, I may have never looked for that solution. I might have just called it business as usual, companies fail all the time, I overextended, my dad was right. But because I knew that I had a commitment to Andrew, his three-year-old daughter and his wife that was expecting their next child, there was no way I was gonna screw it up. And I, I, if you can figure out in your life how to get the motivation to get the information you need to make it work, that's number one. The third lesson uh, I learned is hustle to help. I believe you can only keep what you give away. Sounds crazy, people are like, what, so I want money, I'm gonna give it away? Yes. It's crazy, crazy idea. If you want love in your life, give it away. If you want success in your life, ask people, how can I be helpful? If you go to this event tonight and you never say those words, you don't get it. I learned that lesson, and this room especially is interesting. Five years ago, no, not that long ago, four years ago, I was at a conference in Halifax, and there was this awesome speaker, this guy named Mike McDermott, founder of FreshBooks. He was speaking. And I had learned a while ago, like, you, you know, you always got to just give. Like, just whatever, you know, just be helpful. Don't expect anything in return, et cetera. So as Mike and I were walking between conference rooms, I actually said, hey, Mike, I'm Dan, you know, founder of, I think at the time I was working on Flowtown. Uh, what's new? And he started telling me about some ideas, and I was like, hey, uh, there's actually a friend of mine that built something similar to what you were just telling me about. Do you want an introduction? He said, that'd be great. I said, cool, I'll make the intro. Made the intro, didn't think anything of it. Six months later, Mike emails me, hey Dan, I'm organizing this event, I'd love for you to speak at it. I was like, really cool. I was like, where is it? He's like, Toronto. Sweet, it's called Mesh Marketing. So a uh, couple weeks before the event, they put up the marketing site. I start tweeting it out, kind of like I was doing for this, like, oh, I'm in Toronto, I'm gonna speak at Mesh Marketing. This tweet comes back at me. Hey, Dan, if you're in town, I'd love to have coffee. I like look at the profile and I'm like, who, who's this? This beautiful blonde woman. <laughs> so I email her, I'm like, hey, I'm really busy, but maybe we can figure out time to meet at the conference. She's like, cool. So uh, the, the event was actually organized here. So the day of the event, I'm coming down the stairs and I meet this blonde woman at the bottom of that escalator. And she kind of blew me off. She's like, uh, you know, I'm busy, I'm talking, like, you know, it's like, oh, have fun speaking, maybe we'll connect later. And I was like, oh, what the hell? I thought we were gonna have coffee. Anyways, <laughs> whatever. Um, that night we're at the mixer at the Drake Hotel and, you know, I just watched this, this woman kind of walk around the crowd and she seemed to know everybody and she was really interesting and, you know, we didn't really get a chance. And at the end of the night, as things are winding down, 11 o'clock, she comes over, she's like, oh, I'm so sorry, we didn't get a chance to talk. You know, next time you're in town, we should connect. I said, I'm in town for three days. She's like, oh, okay, well, maybe we should do dinner. I said, yeah, we're doing dinner. <laughs> uh, and we did. Fast forward two and a half years on August 17th of last year, one of the most amazing things happened to me in my life. My son Max was born. Renee, who is this beautiful blonde woman, is my wife. And about two months ago, our other son Noah was born. And I can't tell you all the moments in my life that have connected that create those kind of opportunities, but I know that if Mike had not invited me to speak at this conference because I went out of my way to try to be helpful for him, that I probably wouldn't have met the love of my life. So don't expect anything, but seriously, hustle to help others. If you're ever having a bad day, I tell this to entrepreneurs all the time, when they're having the worst day possible, when the whole world seems like it's fighting against you and your world's just crumbling around, the best thing you could possibly do is help somebody else. It will turn you around like that. Just tweet out, hey man, here's my cell, call me if I can be helpful. Call your friend that you know has a small business, they're just starting, hey man, I got a couple hours, you wanna get coffee? Do whatever you can do. When you help other people, you can't help. That's what I love about Clarity. When I'm on the call, yes, it's a paid call, but I can't tell you the energy and vibe that I get when I hang up that phone. 
I get sometimes more out of it than the entrepreneur, I think. So try to go out of your way to hustle to help. Um, the third story and belief uh, that I want to talk to you about is you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Think about that. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. If you have not achieved the level of success or you are frustrated where you're at in your life and you're still hanging out with your high school stoner drunk friends on weekends, think about that. And that is the single thing that changed in my life when I was 26 that allowed me to eventually go on to sell that company, Sphere Technologies, and has been the pivotal thing in everything that I've done since then. When I was 26, check this out, because it's kind of nuts, and I didn't know how nuts it was at the time. I started, hired three employees. My goal, only because I said so out loud, was I want to grow 150% year over year. Where that came from, I don't know. Does that make sense? Probably not. But I said it, so I wanted to do it. Come year two, we're about 12 employees doing million, 1.4 million in revenue. And I, so there's this thing in a, uh, in a service industry, it's very seasonal. And what happened was is uh, at the end of the year, uh, nobody wants to make decisions. So you have a bunch of employees, they all get paid, they go on vacation, and I'm sitting there looking at my pipeline of customers going, how am I going to make ends meet? I just hired these three guys. I have no projects for them. The companies don't want to sign any contracts because the budgets aren't approved yet. And two other things happen at the end of each year that makes it quite unique for me. One is my birthday on December 26. So I don't know about you guys, but my birthday is that one time a year that I get to reflect on everything I've done and see if I've made some progress. So here I was going, oh shit, I've overextended myself. I'm going to go out of business yet again. Two, New Year's Eve. Like you couldn't put more pressure on an individual that had no clear idea of what the heck was gonna go on. It got so bad, I got depressed. I caught myself, I've never admitted this out loud before, I would take a bath and put my head under water and just leave my nose so I could breathe. And I would lay there until the water got cold. That's how stressed out I was. I didn't have a friend that understood this industry. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have an advisor. I did the best I could do, reading books, reading blogs, trying to look at my cash, manage the business, and yet I was thinking, I'm going to screw it up. Everybody at that point that had hired, that were working for me, I'm going to have to lay off. And out of desperation, I cold emailed. I said, who in the world would care if I didn't exist as a business? It's an interesting question to ask. I was like, who would care if my company shut down? And I thought, ha ha, the government. <laughs> Not the answer you're expecting. And I figured, they care about creating jobs. I had created jobs. And even better than that, I had created export revenue. All of our customers are in the States, and I was in Moncton, New Brunswick. So I cold emailed Frank McKenna, who at the time was a retired, he was the prime minister, or yeah, the minister? Premier of New Brunswick. I said, if anybody cares that if I die in a month, as a business, not personally, uh, was Frank McKenna, and I cold emailed him. And I said, Frank, I have a company, it's called Sphere Technologies, I'm based in Moncton, I have 12 employees, all of our customers are in the States, and I have no clue what I'm doing. I don't know if what I'm doing is right, I don't know if what I'm doing is, I think it's cool, it's probably not cool. Is there anybody else like me in this province that you think I should talk to? And we're talking like one in the morning. 30 minutes later, I get a reply. Three names, Jerry Pond, uh, Steve Palmer, Ken Nickerson. I didn't even reply to ask him who these people were. I'm not an idiot, I can Google. <laughs> <laughs> just, the fact that he replied, I was impressed. I wasn't gonna bug him even further. And I Google these guys. Jerry Pond today is, is like the Ron Conway of investors in Canada. He invested in Radian 6 and Q1 Labs. But Jerry's old, and I mean, if you Google his name, here's this, what I think is a grumpy looking dude on a website, all dressed in his like, suit and tie, and I'm like, and, J and this, Frank wants me to email this guy, he's probably gonna rip my head off, like, but I did it anyways. I did that for all three of those guys. Jerry responded the next day and said, what's your number, I'll give you a call. Steve said, 
Sunday, 7 a.m., Tim Hortons on Mount Road. And Ken said, I live in Toronto, I'm there in the summers, how about we get on a call? None of them even hesitated to help me. Those people changed my life. I never asked that they would be a mentor. I didn't, you know, I just spent time with them, asked questions, and anytime they would suggest that I do something, I would do it. Even if I circled back later and said, you know, that thing you told me to do actually doesn't work for our industry anymore. It might have worked 20 years ago, but not anymore. But I always gave them that feedback. And when I sold Spheric and I was debating if I should move to San Francisco, the hardest thing for me inside was I didn't want to feel like a traitor. I didn't want to feel like one of those guys that leaves because I was super proud to be Canadian, especially from New Brunswick. And Ken Nickerson said to me, I remember that phone call. I was sitting on the stairs. I said, Ken, I don't want people to think I'm a traitor and just leaving the province. He said, the best thing you could ever do for New Brunswick is go to San Francisco, learn, and bring it back. It took me five years, but Clarity is based in Moncton, New Brunswick. Thanks. Those three guys ended up opening my eyes to how important it is to spend time with people that have created big, meaningful companies. And it's hard, and it will take time. But someday you'll realize, I was, I was giving a talk earlier at Jolt, and they said, what's the biggest thing you learned being in San Francisco? And I said, the biggest thing is, I can't help but think big. Why? Because I got lucky and I met guys like Brian and Joe Jebia from airbreadandbreakfast.com. That's what it used to be called, airbnb.com. Travis Kalanick, who's the CEO of Uber, was an investor in Flowtown. Ryan Holmes, the founder and CEO of Hootsuite, is a good friend of mine. Um, Drew from Dropbox, I met the first week I landed in San Francisco. These four guys have created billion dollar companies in three to five years. I can't go back from thinking that way. So again, if you're thinking about having more success or doing more in your entrepreneurial career, ask yourself, who am I spending the most time with? Right? And if you want to elevate your game, figure out how you can spend time with guys that are building companies, raising capital. Um, and it doesn't even have to be within your industry. And it doesn't have to be that frequent. Just do it like every month. Just ask them for coffee. Spend time with them. It's the most important thing you can do. It's up there with the other ones. Um, but the, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. It's super powerful. So I promise I'm going to leave you guys with this one last story. It's the story of one of the best entrepreneurs I've ever met in my career, and his name is Pierre. Pierre is my brother. And six years ago, Pierre was working as a mechanic. And Pierre's always been more entrepreneurial than I am. Like growing up, he was the guy that bought a car when he was 12, fixed it up, ended up selling it when he was 13. And by the time he actually got his license, he was driving a Mustang. You know, like that was just, he was a wheeler and dealer. I was like kind of introverted and geeky. You guys probably wouldn't see that now, but I was, you know, I was a tech guy. And Pierre loved cars so much that he decided, well, I should go become a mechanic and maybe someday I'll start a, like my own mechanic shop. So. Pierre goes to college, uh, you know, gets his first thing, does his apprenticeship at this, uh, at this shop uh, called Ralph's. And Pierre ends up winning awards. Like, he is really good at troubleshooting. I mean, electronics and cars. Ralph really enjoyed his internship. He did his apprenticeship there. At the end of it, you know, he was going to go start his own shop. Ralph says to him, hey, Pierre, if you keep doing what you've been doing, I'm actually looking to retire soon. You know, we should probably work something out, and you can stay here, and someday I'll sell you the business. And Pierre's like, awesome. Cool. First year goes by, Pierre hustles, the shop grows 30%, they add an extra bay. Uh, Pierre's treating the business like his business. End of the year goes to Ralph, he's like, hey Ralph, like we haven't sat down, figured out anything, paperwork, you know, I'd love to do that. And Ralph's like, hey man, things are great, I love what you're doing. You know, it's Christmas time, I'm busy, how about we circle back in a bit? Another year goes by. Pierre goes to Ralph and says, hey man, it's been two years now, we promised you'd put something on paper, I know you're busy. I want to do something, and, and this is four years that Pierre worked there. Ralph says, dude, things are going so well, I just don't see myself retiring anytime soon. So Pierre says, I quit. And I was, I was probably a year or two into Sphere, and I get a call from Pierre, and he says, we need to talk. I was like, okay, what's going on? He's like, I don't want to talk about it, meet me at my house. All right. 
That's a weird call from your brother. So I leave the office, I go to his house, I see Pierre sitting on the back patio, and I was like, what's up, dude? He goes, I just quit my job. I was like, cool, what are we doing now? Like, this is great. And he's like, I don't know, man, like, I'm just, and I was like, well, don't, don't you want to open up your own shop? He goes, I actually don't like being a mechanic. <laughs> I was like, that's a good lesson to learn now versus having taken over that shop. So I ask him what I like to ask every entrepreneur. What are you passionate about? What, do you, what would you want to be doing every day? And he starts, you know, he's like, well, I really like real estate. And, you know, recently I helped my friend every weekend for the last, I think it was eight weeks, his friend would pay him in beer and he helped him build his house. And at the end of it, he said, he goes, I really thought it was neat that not only did I help my friend build a house, but I helped build his home. And I knew that he was going to, like, marry his wife and end up, you know, with kids and... He just thought there was something really special about building homes. And I'm like, well, build houses. He's like, I don't know how to build houses. I was like, good, because you're not supposed to, right? You're never, not supposed to know how to do anything the first time you do it. That is entrepreneurship. Feel good if you feel confused. <laughs> it's a normal state. You are not supposed to know how to be successful as an entrepreneur when you start. So he gets going, and, he's, and, and I was so excited for him. He needed money. I actually wrote him a check for everything I had in my bank account. Because I don't know about you guys, but when it comes to family, there's nobody I want to see more. And I told him when I gave him that money, I said, I don't care if I ever see it again. I love you. I just want to see you try. And if you screw up in two or three years and it doesn't work out, fair game. And he tried. Pierre wanted to compete in price. He thought, I can build a house cheaper than everybody else, and I won't use real estate agents, and I will sell more houses. And I didn't know this at the time, um, but he calls me up. It was like six months later, he ended up building a couple houses, and he says, Dan, we need to talk. I was like, oh, shit. I've gotten this call before. <laughs> um, you know, I was busy with the company. I wasn't thinking. And... Um, you know, we'd talk about business. He said it was good. He was swinging a hammer. It was like, you know, he'd built four houses. And he says, I want uh, come to my house. We need to talk. So I go to his house. I knock on the back door. I kind of hear like this faint voice, like, come in, I'm at my office. I'm like, okay, whatever. Open the door. Walk into his kitchen. He had like a kitchen dining room. No furniture. I was like, Pierre, are you here? He's like, yeah, I'm in my office. Okay. I walk down further into the living room. No furniture. I was like, Pierre, I think somebody stole all your shit. <laughs> he goes, I don't want to talk about it. Come to my office. I'm walking down the hallway to his office, and I see him there. And if I had my, I have a picture. I took a picture. And I look into his bedroom, and he's, there's no furniture. There's just an air mattress on the floor and a sleeping bag. And I'm like, dude, what's going on? And he starts to tell me the story that he built the wrong house. In the industry, the real estate industry, there's actually this thing called no curb appeal. So Pierre built the house with no curb appeal. And what you learn quickly is it doesn't matter how cheap it is, if a guy's gonna buy his house, especially with his wife, if she doesn't love that house, he ain't buying it. Right? And he ended up overbuilding. He wanted to take the market by storm. He had the best price. Yes, the best price. He built the ugliest houses ever. <laughs> I wish I had a picture. And I was like, well, what's going on? He goes, I didn't want to tell you, but I remortgaged my house. I maxed out my line of credits. And I can't figure out how to sell these houses. And I was like, well, what happened to all your furniture? And he said, well, I was talking to a real estate agent. She said, you might have better luck if you stage the house. He, he couldn't afford to rent furniture to put it in his house. He took his own furniture and filled up one of his units. That was the moment I knew that I was working and, and seeing one of the best entrepreneurs. He was going to do whatever it took to make it right. And I was like, crap. So the first thing we did is we called my little brother and said, Mo, you're buying a house. No joke. I said, I'm giving you five grand as a deposit, and you're buying that house. He's like, what? I'm like, you're now a homeowner. Stop paying rent. <laughs> you're good to go. 
<laughs> I wish he was here, because he always like, he remembers that it happened so fast, he doesn't know why he said yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, he lived in one of those really ugly houses. Luckily, we ended up selling the others. But what we did is we sat down, and I just asked Pierre, I said, OK, what have you learned? He said, I learned that women make the decision. <laughs> I said, are you willing to go all the way with this? He says, what do you mean? I said, I have this crazy idea. The next six months, there was a home show. In his trade show booth, his slogan was, Martel Homes, unlike your husband, we listen. <laughs> Women would walk by the home show with their husband and do like you just did and elbow their husband and say, listen, they know what they're talking about. <laughs> Pierre did this thing called the customer cocktail hour where he invited his ideal customer, first time home buyers, women, hired somebody to drive them around, gave them cocktails, you know, got their juices flowing, and went and looked at all of the competitors' houses. And they took notes. And at the end of that afternoon, they sat down with the architect and they took, showed him all the pictures and all the notes they took of the houses they visited. And they ended up designing one of the most beautiful houses you've ever seen. He went on in that year to sell 16 houses. Like near, like he was gone, like bankrupt. To, we've got some ideas flowing. Where were you in, you know, <laughs> six years ago? Um, he ended up selling 16 homes. Pierre got so good at understanding who his customer was that he, I said, well, what are the other problems that they have? Well, they don't know where their contractor is. When they buy a home, it's like notorious, they're always late. He came out with this thing called the 99-day construction countdown. He guaranteed your house would be built in 99 days. And if he was one day late, it was $500 fine. He's never paid a fine. It turns out that 99 days is what every home builder builds. Now you're not in Toronto, but in Moncton, you know, it's essentially three months. Every home builder was like, what's so fucking unique about this? Everybody, I do that. <laughs> Pierre put his name on it. He said, you know, people don't know where their contractor is. He put Wi-Fi devices in the trucks so that you could go on the website and see in real time on Google Maps where all of the site supervisors were. And you could click through and watch the video out of the front of the truck to see. He noticed that the customers every day, pretty much every night, would drive to the construction site. Why they did that, he was confused. I said, well, ask them. <laughs> so he went and he sat there and he's like, hey, customer, curious, why do you come here every night? And they said, this is the largest financial decision we've ever made in our lives and we're really excited. It's, and and th this was the emotional part when it kind of clicked for him. He, it was like the, like the one thing in their day that was better than anything else. So he said, well, how can we take that and share it? And he started taking digital photos every week, branded it with Martel Home Builders, and gave it, proactively sent it to all his customers. You know what they did with it? They started posting it on Facebook, sharing it with their coworkers. Pierre started selling houses to people living in Calgary that were thinking of moving home because of photos they saw on Facebook. Then there was this day that I gave him an idea, and he kind of fought with me on it. I said, Pierre, I'm in San Francisco. I got this crazy idea. You should put pink mustaches on the front of your trucks. He goes, dude, I love you. You're smart, whatever. I'm not doing that. I said, yeah, 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 you, you want to do this. He goes, you don't understand. They would laugh. I'm not doing that. I said, Pierre, your customers are women. They want to see a pink mustache on your freaking truck. <laughs> I love you, man. I'm not doing it. I don't give a shit what you say. I said, well, why don't we think about a charity? Why don't you give to breast cancer? There's a reason for those pink mustaches on your truck. To this day, Pierre's raised tens of thousands of dollars for breast cancer because he understood who his customer was. The reason I tell you that story is because I can't think of anybody that got so low, that went through so much, that out of desperation would have done anything you told him. If I said, Pierre, put your head through that wall and you'll be successful or this will go away, he would have just jumped up and did it. And I can't tell you how many times I don't see that level of energy in entrepreneurs and they wonder why. You know, my brother's gone on now. He builds over 100 homes a year. He's a multi-millionaire. He was ranked one of the fastest growing home builders in Canada. He gets called from companies in the States going, how the hell are you doing all this marketing? Because he spends no money on real estate agents. So we're going to open it up to questions, but I, I want to leave you guys with one thing. And it's the thing that I learned 
in San Francisco, back in Moncton, and I'm going to ask you guys to do this, is no small plans. Does everybody agree? No small plans. Thanks for having me tonight. Dan, Dan your, your brother sounds great. Does he want to come do a lived it lecture? He would love to. He's not as big. He doesn't like he to speak as much. He could tell all the stories that he, all the ideas he gave to you. Oh, my brother is a genius. Yes, I would, I'll get him to Toronto for sure. Yeah, next time. So if, if anyone has questions, we have two mics in the audience. If you want to come up, I've got a couple minutes for questions. All I would ask is that you say your name and your question. So I like to know people's names. Don't be shy. You can just scream can, it from your I chair. I can ask one while people get over their shyness. Um, what's the most surprising thing about your whole journey in entrepreneurship? Most unexpected thing? Besides the confusion that you mentioned. That's a great question, Carrie. Um, I am still blown away by the fact that I get to work on things that I love to do every day. I, I'm not going to play that down because I feel absolutely humbled and blessed that every day my investors trust me, my employees trust me, my customers trust me, my whatever. They trust me to work on something that I am like, I kind of, I almost feel like an imposter. I don't know if you guys ever felt like that. Like even today, I've been doing this for 10 years, I almost feel like I'm worried that somebody's going to figure me out. But then usually I do something smart and I'm like, all right, cool. This is not, you know, this isn't luck. Like I've actually got some sudden. So I, I don't know, like to this day, I'm still like, I, I kind of am still excited about what I get to do every day because, you know, I, can, I truly came from a small town. I had a pretty rough upbringing. And the life I live today with my wife and beautiful kids and the travel I get to do and speak in front of, you know, with entrepreneurs is just, just amazing. So that, that would be this, even today, I still feel blessed. So thanks for asking that question. Great. And we've got a question over there. With the Hi, my name is Sam. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay, so you talked about uh, that you're the average of the top five friends that you spend the most time with. Um, so this is multi-part, or I just want you to maybe explain more about that. Did you, how did you move, did you, did you feel like a traitor when you left those friends that were drinking all the time? Or, because right now I'm like, oh, yeah, that's so true in my life. I should probably move away from them. But how do you not... Be a traitor. Hey, you drink too no, much. That, that's I, a legit question. I need question. to hang out yeah. with more successful people. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, question one, and then there's a two part. Uh, how did you do that All right. <laughs> without alienating them? Yeah. And Sam? Yeah. Thanks for the question, Sam. Um, here's what I've realized is if they truly are your friends, they want to see you do well. They want to see you be passionate about what you do. They want to see you working and being excited. And if you explain to them, like, you know, like, hey, I'm really busy and we won't have time to, like, you know, go to the football game or party or drink or whatever because I've got to work on this thing that I, it's just so, you're having so much fun and they get upset for you for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't even have yeah. to, you know what I mean. Yeah. And the ones, their true friends, they will see that and they will support you. That's what I love about my wife. I could get a call right now and she would be with me. She, go, go do that call. Close that deal. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's the kind of people you want to be around. Or you're like, friends are like, hey man, I just, you know, I just, Ryan Holmes raises $126 million, calls me the day before he announces it publicly from Hootsuite. That was awesome. Like Carrie's question, what surprises me to this day? Still that kind of shit that I get to, to, to just be around people that do that. And so what, motivation do you need to make that decision? I don't know. Like, I didn't expect my life to look like this. And I just started saying, okay, are you, are you supporting me? Or are you holding me back? And you have to be ruthless and cut. Like, and I don't, it doesn't mean you don't love them. It doesn't mean you don't go to their birthday parties. It just means you spend less time with them. Like, I love my mom. My mom's an alcoholic. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, it's cool. Um, but I don't spend as much time with her because, you know, she has her challenges. When, when she, when she wants to get better, I'll be there for her. I think that's the same thing with like friends that are like that. It's, you know, if they, what happens, and this has happened to me a lot in my life, happened with my brother, he saw me doing well, he then asked me, how do you do that? And I think if you move on and you kind of start doing your thing, they're gonna go, hey man, how did you, Sam, how'd you create that? I'd love to start my own business. And then you can be supportive and then boom, you guys are both doing some really interesting stuff. So, great question. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, name and question. 
Uh, my name's Simon. I'm actually from New Brunswick myself, so. Shut up. Anybody else from New Brunswick? <laughs> All right, Simon, it's me and you, man. <laughs> So I guess the first thing is thanks for repping the place so that these people might venture out there someday. It's not just a bridge from Quebec to Nova Scotia, there's actually some pretty cool There's more there. there. Um, so I guess my, my question is around that, that, that subject is, you know, you started a business in San Francisco, or at least you had a business in San, in San Francisco, and now you went back to the Maritimes. Um, so I guess my first question is, what's different from running a, a I mean, there's, there's the obvious, the culture is a lot, faster, I guess, San Francisco, level of talent's different as well, but uh, what are the biggest differences you've seen aside from that, building a business in San Fran and building a, a business in, in Moncton? So all the things are true that you might say in regards to um, the culture's different, the talent's different, but here's what I've learned is, and this room is proof, right? This event's going on, I'm, you know, regardless of who's speaking, you guys decide to come out tonight and there's probably 10,000 other people that want to start businesses, that want to be entrepreneurs, that aren't here tonight. So in every community, including Moncton, there are startup-y type people, and they're brilliant. You'd be surprised how many companies from San Francisco, like there's two of Mozilla, you know the browser? Two of their top engineers live in New Brunswick. And I learned that in San Francisco. I was like, give me their names, I want to meet with them. I didn't hire them. But like Radian 6, right? $350 million exit. There's talent anywhere as you go. And if you can just find the first 12, I think 12 is the right number. Your first 12 employees will dictate your success. You got to get those first 12 right. So in regards to are there 12 people that will join your startup that are startup e community? Yes, look at this room. There's proof that, it, especially in Toronto, and it exists in Moncton. And the other thing is, is, and I told this to the teams at Jolt, is you need to understand that you don't have to live in San Francisco, but if you're doing a tech startup, it's kind of like if you're an actor, you go to Hollywood. If you're in finance, maybe you go to New York. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be in tech, you've got to go to San Francisco. You don't have to live there, but I am constantly there pretty much every two months on the seventh week. I take seven days and I go New York, San Francisco, Toronto. And I live in Moncton, and I love the quality of life there, but I also need to go get my fix right, because it is a special place, sure. but then I take that energy, I go back home and I execute and then I start it over. So I think you can live in Toronto and build huge, amazing companies and there's so many examples locally. Talk to those entrepreneurs. Their email, guys, this is really simple, first name at company.com. <laughs> it's my email, it's their email, it's probably your guys' email, like that, it's not that hard. If you email them and say, I'm, I've got a company, here's the link to my site, don't just say I want to start, I've got a company, here's the link to my site, I love what you've created. Do you have time for a quick, start with a phone call, maybe do coffee. Um, you'd be surprised how many people will get back to you. Great question, Simon. And, and why did you go back to Moncton? Um, so the honest truth, and I, the government hates when I say this, but because uh, of my family. Like they're like, oh, did you move back because it's cheaper and tax credits and all that stuff? No. It's harder. It is harder. Like I'm not going to mess around on stage. It is harder to build. If you took the same tech company you started in Toronto, take the same team and you put them in San Francisco and you talk about success being an acquisition, it will be three to seven times harder to do it in Toronto than it is in San Francisco. Is it impossible? No. That should not be a reason that you complain and say it's hard. It's not impossible. It is harder. And that means you got to do stuff like I do, travel, right? Hire people that live in other places and, and try to hire them in the summertime because you're never going to get them to move in the winter, you know? <laughs> You learn these tricks, but it's possible. <laughs> it's just harder. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, the reason I moved back is I had, you know, my first son. I wanted to be close to the family. It's a crazy story. Three brothers and a sister, we all have two kids under the ages of pretty much a year and eight months. It's like we call, we kind of did. My brother calls it, guess what, I'm having a kid. I'm like, working right, I'm on it. It's like, yeah. <laughs> my other brother's like, guess what, we're having one. And then as soon as the first one's around, it's like, well, you know, let's do it again. And you, I couldn't have planned it, but I mean, absolutely blessed. And that's why I decided to build my company there. And, and almost, because I said I would. And I, and I don't think where you live is gonna dictate your success. You choose. And here's the other thing I'm gonna leave you guys with. I'll answer more questions is, people need to stop saying, how do we become the next Silicon Valley? So I think it's bullshit. I, th I hate when people say, oh, you're like the next whatever. Stop trying to be the next Silicon Valley and just be the best damn frickin' Toronto you can be. Right, because that is all that matters. <laughs> be the best Toronto. If there's something unique about the culture, leverage that. It's different here, be okay with it. Thanks for the question, Simon. Cool, thank By you. By the way, two New Brunswickers. There we go, <laughs> so we got two. There's more, they're just shy.
We're just shy. Yes, name and question. Hey, Dan, my name's Jawad. Uh, thank you, first of all, for coming and sharing your, your wisdom with us. I started my app development business about three years ago. I've been developing apps, got my 10th app onto the App Store just recently. But as a person that's been like a techie that's just been coding, 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 and not as much time on sales or marketing, how do you, what advice would you have for someone that wants, needs to transition away from building, building, and focusing on actually making money in the business? And your name is? Jawad. Jawad. How do you spell it? J-A-W-A-A-D. Oh, yeah, Jawad. Yeah. Um, how is your business doing? Like, it's, it's pretty fun. You have a couple employees? No, it's just, I'm just a one man show. But you're right making now. pretty good money. Making enough to live? No. All right. <laughs> Frankly speaking. I mean, the fact that you made any money, congrats. That's awesome, right? Um, I think the next step, you know, it's, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but just find somebody who's done it, right? So, uh, a good friend of mine, um, uh, a good friend of mine, can't remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> now, if I say his name, he's going to know. So I'm better off. Um, Amit <laughs> from Five Mobile. Amit's awesome. He's a business guy with enough tech. Reach out to Amit, Amit at fivemobile.com or whatever. And uh, he's from Toronto. Take him up for coffee. Tell him Dan said you should reach out to him. He can help you understand how to make that transition. But like I said, just find people who have done it before. It's surprising how, as long as you show them that you're doing and you're not talking, I have all the time in the world for doers. All the time. If you just want to talk about your idea, zero. Unapologetic. Sorry, I don't want to be a dick, but it's zero. And if you've emailed me and I've replied and said, I'm busy, don't have time, it's because I didn't feel you were doing and I think that's super important. So if you can quickly communicate that you're a doer and you're trying to create something, those people will have all the time in the world for you. Thanks for asking that question. Thank you. It's great. Hi there. My name is Eric Sorensen. I work at a tech startup here in Toronto, and uh, I was wondering a little bit about, uh, I know through your story about Pierre, you talked about knowing your customers, and I just wondered if you had a, a perspective on uh, designing a user experience for the customer. It seems to me there's two schools of thought. One, do what you think is best and don't listen to your customers. They don't know what they want, and the other is listen very carefully and do everything they ask for, and I think we're somewhere in between. I'm just wondering if you have some thoughts on Eric? that. Eric? Eric, yeah. So here's my thoughts on this. A lot of people get that mentality because they hear about Steve Jobs. Here's what people don't realize is Steve Jobs got every email. Steve at apple.com went to Steve. He read every email. Sometimes he replied. He used to spend time spying on people at the Apple stores. So if you think that he wasn't listening to his customers, you're on crack. <laughs> right? Anybody that knew Steve was fanatical about reading the press, how people perceived his products, but he kind of looked at trends, and I, I can't prove it, but I have this feeling that he had people that worked for him that would just graph technologies, because everything from when he got rid of USB, or he got rid of the mouses and all these things, it was like this perfect timing, right? When he decided to double down HTML5 and get rid of Flash, it was like kind of like, you just see it. They were always good at it, and I bet there's like this formula inside their company that I wish they would just tell people about. Um, all that on a rant to say, Steve Jobs definitely listened to his customers. Here's what I suggest. And it's, it's a, kind of an easy framework. Always build the product initially, hopefully, for yourself. Because even if it fails, you at least solved your own problem. <laughs> it's a pretty powerful thing. Most people don't even think of doing that. Like, make it work for you. Do you know how many companies that work on products, and when I ask them how many people in your company use it, and they say zero? I invested in one of those recently. I was like, hey, you guys built this. I can't say because then they'll know. But anyways, they built this technology, <laughs> and I said, why aren't you using your own technology for your own company? And they said, it doesn't work for us. Well, if it doesn't work for you, it probably doesn't work for your customer. That's why you're having a hard time. Right? So I always suggest build it for yourself. Once you've got that solved, because that's cool, that your life's better, um, then what you want to do is say, here's the spec. Here's what I think the market wants, and then go find 10 customers. Don't change the spec. Go talk to those 10 customers. Get their feedback. Don't go to mainstream customers. Find early adopters. People forget this. Like in Moncton, everybody wants to start a restaurant. People want to do restaurant startups or whatever, because it's what they know. And they go to the restaurant. They say, hey, I have this way for you to allow your customers to order from your table. And they're like, oh, that's awesome. Come see me when it's built. Oh, cool, so you would use it. Yeah, that's, all, that's for sure. Why wouldn't I want to use that? Cool. They go talk to 10 companies. They all say they're in. They go build it, they come back, they show it to the restaurant owner, and they're like, ah, it doesn't really work the way I thought it would, it doesn't integrate with a point of sale system, ah, thanks for coming out. 
that sucks. That hurts, right? Like, the biggest risk is you build something for somebody that don't want anything. So what I say is, try to find companies that had the pain so much that they actually solved it themselves. So fine, if you were building a software to help people buy from the restaurant from their table, is there anybody that's doing that today in Toronto? If yes, go find out. If they actually built their own iPhone app and paid 100 grand to be able to do that because they felt it was that important, learn from how they built it, how they integrated it. And then from that, you build the specs that you then go and try to sell to 10 other early adopter customers. Only when all 10 of them say, I'm not giving you a penny, and you've got to ask for money, right? It's the key. I was talking to guys earlier, and they're like, oh, I wish I would have heard this before. They spent too much time building stuff nobody wanted. Ask for the money. I always joke that it's the most, uh, no, I'm not going to say that. Anyways, it's very important that you get money uh, because it's a firm commitment that they're willing to be part of the early adopter program. Do that and then start working on the product. Don't, and then if it doesn't work, then change the specs. Go try to find 10 customers. Don't, what happens is you're talking to a customer like, oh, this is awesome and I would give you money, but it needs to do this. You're like, cool, it will do that. They give you the money. So essentially, you keep adding to your roadmap to get one new customer every time. Does that scale? No. Don't do that. It's probably what you've done so far, and it's dangerous. Well, it's, it's more about sort of the, the internal debate. We're, I mean, we're talking to customers, and, and we did design for, for ourselves to, to, in terms of you know, what we want to do, solving the problem that we're facing. Uh, but it's, it's more about the, uh, getting the sort of everybody on board on the same so every, every, so I actually think the word MVP is a mistake because it has the word product in it. I use, I use the word Mevo. It's so businessy. Again, I don't have an MBA. Uh, minimum economical viable offer. No product, one page sheet, three benefits. Three features, three benefits. Right. Try to hypothesize who you think the customer is. Go sell that to 10 customers. You come back, nobody bought, change it. Go try again. They kind of liked it, but they didn't like it. Change it, try to sell it again. And I always say give three earnest tries before you pivot away from the market. Because it's product market fit. You've got to pivot the product and you've got to pivot the market. Uh, it's not just the product. Too many times you just pivot the product and it's actually the market's not there. So it doesn't matter how awesome the tool is, nobody wants it. So hopefully that was helpful. Yeah, it was. Thanks. Great answer. Thanks for the question. Yes. Um, hi, Dan. My name is Sherry. Hey, Sherry. Um, I wanted to ask about Clarity building an online marketplace. I'd love to talk about Clarity. Good, good. Well, it's your, your fifth company, so you know, I'm sure the bar for you is really high. But if you're going to start an online marketplace where you bring together buyers and sellers, for Clarity, what was the biggest challenge you had, and how did you overcome it? And what generic advice would you give for any online marketplace startup? So there's this great saying that says, do, my dad, you say, do what I say, not what I do. And I feel like that's probably the better way that I can answer. I can tell you what I did, but it actually was stupid. Okay? Pretty much, if you look at Clarity's growth, it's like flat, growth, flat, growth. Like, every time I fix things that I learned, it got better. So how about I just skip and tell you what I do today and what you should do in the beginning? And we did some things really smart and other things not so smart. Number one for a marketplace is focus it's liquidity, it's about buyers and sellers. So focus on getting transactions going between a market, right? So if you're starting an e-commerce site and you're selling wearable computers, don't do the whole wearables category, do watches. And try to get people listing their watches and people buying their watches through your platform. You know, if you're, for clarity, it would have been tech entrepreneurs and marketing advice. Just that, nothing else. You're a tech entrepreneur, cool, we're for you. You want marketing advice, cool. No, you want business advice, like business development, not for you, right? In the early days, people forget. Yelp started by city, Foursquare started by city, uh, Facebook started by universities. Um, every good marketplace did that, right? And you need to build the compression and liquidity in the market. The other advice I'd say is your supply needs to, your supply needs to create the, the liquidity. What I mean is that, if you just get a bunch of people, like if our experts just signed up on Clarity and then said, cool, get me calls, Clarity wouldn't work. It can't work. I can't acquire a customer to drive the demand to you at scale because the cost for me to acquire that customer and your probability of not responding is too high for me to make the economics work. The only way that you can make a marketplace work at scale is if your supply is promoting itself. Right, if you think about Etsy, Think about air bed and breakfast. Airbnb built a tool that took people off Craigslist, built a better profile, and let you publish back to Craigslist. The people on Airbnb promote themselves using their platform. 
you need to figure out how to get them to do that. If you can't get them to do that, you won't scale. Um, so niche, I call it uncomfortably narrow. If it doesn't feel stupid how small the focus is, and you can't get transactions going where you're at 95%, customer comes to the site, buys, and gets a happy experience, don't expand from that, because that's really hard to do, right? Look at Uber. Uber recruited the drivers, put them through training, and launched in San Francisco. And only once they perfected that did they go to city by city, and only once they perfected black cars did they then look at UberX, and then, you know what I mean? Like, they've really been methodical about that. Um, and then the third thing is your supply needs to make enough money every month that they care about you. That number is usually around 1,000 to 1,500 a month. If you can't get somebody making 1,000 to 1,500 a month, even if it's secondary income in a marketplace, they won't invest the time to promote themselves to make you successful. Those are three really hard things I wish somebody would have taught me. I learned it from the guy at Fiverr. If you want to go on Clarity, search for Miha or Fiverr. If you're on Fiverr, it's the craziest place in the world. Um, he taught me those things, uh, and that's why Clarity is now on our next stage of growth. So hopefully that was helpful. So I, I hate to cut off because you have such great answers to these amazing questions, um, but we're just running a little over time, and I think Dan has to catch flight back to Moncton. So if you're available to stick around, we'll take these questions um, offline. And uh, I just want to thank you for a really chock full of advice, guys. inspirational speech. <laughs>